Good evening. Hi, folks. Thank you for coming and thanks for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Um, it's bringing back memories of the early 1990s when I was a registrar here and attending talks and giving them too. So it's, it's, uh, I've been back a few times. It's lovely to be back again and uh, despite the weather. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Tonight I'm going to speak about um, what five years ago would have been called PMS, premenstrual syndrome, and is now called premenstrual dysphoric disorder. It's been recognized as a mental health condition or disorder. And uh, the, I'll apologize in advance. The talk is a, it's a little technical. I'm using a, um, a talk that I give to, to uh, doctors uh, as the template. And uh, professionals are often criticized for um, using elaborate language to hide behind. So an arm becomes an upper extremity. And in my talk, unfortunately, uh, female hormones become gonadal steroids and things like this. So uh, apologies in advance, but I'll, I'll translate some of the stuff if it's, uh, if it's a bit confusing. But you will, I mean, the overview is, I'll give a little bit of a, an overview of um, hormone changes in women. Just a brief mention at the beginning about um, depression around the time of the menopause, and then I will speak about uh, PMDD, also known as PMS. And uh, I'm gonna, it'll be quite practical, so for any of you who suffer from it or have friends or family who do or are just interested in knowing a bit more, it'll give you quite a bit of information that I hope is helpful and quite practical as well to, to look at ways of, of, of feeling better if you, if, if, you suffer, if you or other people suffer from this condition. So um, just to review again, the, the, I start right off with a medical word there, that's great. That, that should read puberty. That's the, you know, the, the, the onset of menses or menarche uh, is, is the onset of puberty and having periods for girls now in the Western world is about 12 to 13. Uh, 150 years ago, it was about, it was around 16 or 17 was the age of onset of puberty. So uh, I'll be coming back to that later, but it's, it's uh, an example of how uh, our, our, our physiology is changing as, 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 um, as the years go by. What happens during, during um, uh, puberty is, and this is, don't worry, this is a very busy, confusing slide, even to doctors, but what it's, what it's reflecting is that in the middle you have female hormones here, also known as gonadal steroids, uh, estrogen or estradiol, and progesterone are the two main ones, you'll have heard of those. And they're, they're released in a, in, a, in a cyclical manner, up, levels going up and down, and they're, and they're released by the ovaries. And uh, they have uh, wide effects throughout the body, they cause um, uh, the development of secondary sexual characteristics, uh, you know, grow, enlargement of hips and changes in voice and uh, they're obviously, the, the, uh, uh, an obstetrician gynecologist will tell you that their primary uh, focus for these hormones in the body is, is on the uterus. A psychiatrist will tell you that the primary focus is on the brain because they have, this, you know, it's, it's, it, they, they have huge effects on, on the developing brain, but really obviously they're their, their, their main focus is to, is to um, facilitate the, 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 the development of the, the lining of the womb, the uterus, for, um, for pregnancy. And, uh, so, but, but from a mental health perspective, what's interesting is that th these hormones are not in a steady state. In a male, you know, the, the, the testosterone hormone is generally a, a steady one, whereas in, 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 in women, you get the, you, there are these fluctuate, fluctuating levels of hormones. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. I'm just going to quickly put, put this, this condition or disorder in, in a sort of a context. The, there are a range of, of depressive type illnesses that women unfortunately are vulnerable to. And the, there are three main ones and they're interrelated. So one would be this condition, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Postnatal depression would be another one. And then perimenopause, which means depression around the time of the menopause, is a third condition. And an important sort of part of this talk that I'm giving is, is a theory, uh, as in most things in psychiatry, these things are, or mental health, these things are theoretical, a lot of them. But the underlying theory of, of all of these conditions is that, is that they relate to 
women's, they're, they're not related to abnormal levels of hormones. So for years, researchers were trying to find what are the abnormalities in hormonal levels in, say, postnatal depression or in depression in women who suffer from PMS. But, there, but the, the levels of hormones amongst women who experience these conditions is no different from those who don't. So what the central theory is that these disorders um, they represent abnormal psychological responses to, to physiologically normal changes in the levels of female hormones. So for reasons that we don't quite understand, a certain subgroup of women are vulnerable to these changes in hormones. And unfortunately, if you're vulnerable to one of these conditions, you're more at risk of the others. It doesn't mean they're inevitable, but certainly women with um, PMDD or premenstrual dysphoric disorder are more likely to get uh, depressed around the menopause, for instance. Okay, so um, and just to mention the menopause quickly before I get on to PMDD, because it's in a very important area. It's probably a man who wrote this definition when you see that there. Uh, so it's, it's not a nice definition or biological sort of... Uh, yeah, so so um, what, what the menopause is, is it's, it's, it's shutting down of ovarian function. Uh, and it, um, it happens on average in Ireland, at the, in the Western world, at the age of 51 and a half. And so, so it's defined as having no, no periods, no menstrual periods for a year, and then raised uh, a blood level of, of a hormone called FSH. Now, how, how do, more importantly, how, what does it feel like and, and, and how does it show itself? Well, periods become irregular and then they stop. And then uh, because of the loss of estrogen, uh, the skin becomes dry. So dry hair, scalp, face, vaginal dryness, and then vasomotor symptoms. So uh, sweating and hot flushes and uh, the, the sort of vasomotor center in your body is in your hypothalamus, which is in the brain, and it's very close to where depression is, uh, one of the centers implicated in depression. So it's, it's just interesting how these, how these things are interlinked. Um, as regards the perimenopause then, that's about the three or four years before a woman enters into the menopause. And um, what happens there is that you can get low levels of estrogen or very high or, 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 or even normal levels. And um, why am I talking about the perimenopause before I talk about PMBDD? Well, it's just an important time to be aware of that it's a time for women, it's an increased risk of depressive symptoms and depressive illness. And it's the, it's the second sort of riskiest time in a woman's life to develop depression. The riskiest time by far is the three months after having a baby. Uh, now, you see, I, I'm, my talk and my focus is very biological, but, but it, it, it's important to remember that, you know, it's based on me having done a lot of research many years ago in the US. It's easy for people who go down one track to forget the bigger picture. The, a lot of people point out to me when I give this talk, and correctly, that, well, there's other reasons for women to get depressed around the time of the menopause. It's, it's, it's a time often of great change in women's lives. They can have, if they've had children, they may be uh, growing up and leaving the home. It's often a time of uh, change in careers, change in friendships, change in roles, all kinds of stressors. So it's important not to forget those. But, but jumping back to the risk of depression, the good news is that once the menopause is established, the rates of depression go right down to the to to, in inverted commas, normal levels, or the risk is, is, is no greater than at other times in a, in a woman's life. So just a final thing on perimenopausal depression, some of the treatment options. One is, is to wait and see. I do a whole other different talk on this based on research that I've done, but it, it's, it's an unusual thing, perimenopausal depression. People can get quite a bad bout of it, and then for, because of the changes in the, ov the ovaries strengthening and weakening, it can, it can disappear quite quickly. So a wait and see attitude is often helpful. These are just different types of hormonal treatments. Once, once you're in the menopause, the hormone treatments are no good for depression. They don't, they don't treat it, unfortunately. They may treat the, 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 the hot flushes and that kind of thing, but they don't treat the depression. But, but, but while while it's while the what, before the menopause has become firmly established, hormonal treatments do work. So estrogen patches. Estrogen now people will often take HRT as a tablet, or you can take it as a pessary, and so on. But 
the estrogen given as a patch has the best scientific medical evidence behind its usefulness. You get steady levels and the estrogen that you give that way passes through the bloodstream into the brain, which is where you want it to go for depression. And, and you, you may or may not be familiar with different types of antidepressants. These are these serotonin antidepressants, which, which would be tablets like Lexapro or Lustral, Sertraline or Prozac, etc. These are, these are particularly useful in the perimenopause. They, they seem to be just particularly beneficial then. And they, and they also have their own anti-hot flush properties. So if you or someone you know is experiencing depression in the perimenopause, it's worthwhile checking, A, or, you know, if they need medication and wish to take it, that it's this type of a medicine, and B, uh, ideally that, and B, has consideration, if, if they're not getting better, been given to, to, to maybe uh, getting some estradiol estrogen patches. And, um, and the combination of those can be used, and they're, it's very, it's very used, very strong combination and safe. Okay, so, so to get back to what the talk is mainly about then, about PMDD, uh, I might lapse into calling it PMS, it's less of a mouthful, and then, and, and then many years ago it was called premenstrual tension. Uh, which is, which is kind of a bit unfair. It's 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 minimizing it really. It's it's it's. Um, I think the new name, while it's a mouthful, really describes the condition better. Uh, anyway, so so uh, the, the, the this is a condition. If you if you think about it, m m many mental health conditions occur along a spectrum. So um, and a lot of medical problems are not like that. So. We can't have a touch of cancer or that kind of thing. You know, you 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 tend to have it or not, but but a lot of mental health conditions are are, are kind of more along a spectrum. Uh, let me just put this around here. Is that? Can you see from over there? Is that? I'm, yeah, I'll stand over here. I'm not a great artist now or anything, but uh, but what I'm saying by that is that say so say if you if you think of. Um, Think of anxiety, for instance. So anxiety is, is we can all experience anxiety at times. Uh, I used to experience it here 30 years ago, giving the talks. I'm old and gray and doing this a long time, so I don't feel at all anxious now, and you're a very nice crowd too. So. <laughs> but say, say you take anxiety, right? So if it goes like that, then what we, kind of what happens in, in, in mental, when you're considering it from mental health perspective is, you know, that there's certain people, you know, this is the intensity of it here and this is the numbers of people. We sort of think of a certain cutoff point and say, well, these are the people who are suffering most seriously and, and, they, and, they, and they've got very marked symptoms, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, so we're going to define this as being illness. But, you know, the criticisms of that are, well, you're, there's doctors m medicalizing human experiences and so on and so forth. And, uh, but, and, and uh, but, so if we think of this with, with, with PMDD, um, the, the question is, 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 is this condition the, the, the really far end of the extreme for people, or, or, is, it a, or is this a separate subgroup of women who, who, who suffer from it? I mean, if you think of it, uh, uh, about 70, 60 to 70 percent of women experience symptoms before their period is due the week before. And most of you are women in the audience, and you'll be familiar with these. There, there, they can be lots of them. There can be physical ones, such as um, uh, retention of fluid, uh, bloating, that kind of thing. There can be um, sleep disturbance, but you can get irritability and uh, you know degrees of anxiety and, and and poor concentration. Lots of things can happen. So, but they're they're not in most women. Thankfully, they're 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 not too marked, but. There is an unfortunate subgroup of women, and it's about 5% of all women, so it's a lot, uh, who experience uh, really marked symptoms, and it's, and, and it's this group here. Uh, m my own feeling on it, most people seem to feel now that this is, it's a separate thing. It's not, it's, it's, it, this is a separate condition of unfortunate women who are very sensitive to these changes in hormones. <laughs> and, and so I, I got to understand more about this condition when I was working in the US back in the, Back in the early noughties, I was a, a research fellow at the National Institutes of Health, which is down in Bethesda, Maryland. And um, uh, so um, I, I worked in a, in a specialist PMS clinic there, PMDD clinic. And um, it was really an eye opener to go there. I mean, uh, the, the, um, the, the, there was a whole mix of women attending the clinic uh, from people who were uh, 
um, from different ethnic backgrounds and some people might be you know unemployed and others would be lobbyists in Washington or senators and this kind of stuff but I was I was really amazed by how disabling this condition was and um, the physical changes I used to see in women which aren't as as recognized really in the criteria but things like the skin changes acne acne breaking out people just looking awful and terrible and, and I would always you know, I remember faces and I would sometimes see and I'd say, have we met? And they'd say, yeah, I met you two months ago. And, and then I, oh, right, you know, and the poor woman would be in and feeling awful and looking terrible and really suffering. And they would, you know, in, in the US, you get hardly any holiday leave or vacation leave, as they call it. They'd use up all their vacation leave for two days every month to try and, so really suffering a lot with the condition. So I got to see it uh, and, and I got a lot of experience working with, with these women and trying to understand them and, and help them too. So anyway, my, my feeling is, and most people who, uh, you know, most researchers in it feel that it's a, it's a distinct syndrome. And uh, what, what is it then? So these are symptoms that occur about a week before the period, is, before the period is com comes, classically a week to 10 days. Mid-cycle, which would be about two weeks into the menstrual cycle, you can get a flare-up of the symptoms as well then. And a key thing though is that the symptoms generally return largely to normal after the period. Because if, if they don't, it's probably another condition that's active, and I'll talk about those later. But it wouldn't be unusual at all for somebody to suffer from depression and then get a worsening before their period is due. Uh, and, then they, and then they get a bit better, but they're still not great. Or they could have bad anxiety and, and it be worse before the period. I'll come back to that. So the um, irritability is kind of considered by many to be the core symptom. In fact, a lot of people argue you, you can't have PMDD without having irritability. Now, now, the, now the, the, the diagnostic criteria that are used allow you not to have irritability, but the vast bulk of people suffering from it have this. And there are, there are essentially f four core sort of emotional symptoms, which are irritability, sadness, mood swings, and anxiety. And I'll come, I'll come back to this in a minute. It's, it's very unusual when you're, when you're doing research into the condition, almost all mental health conditions are diagnosed retrospectively. So you come in, as you know, there's very little technology, unfortunately, in mental health. There's no CAT scans or MRIs to make the diagnosis or anything. So you, you, know, you, use, you, you take a history, you can use rating scales and so on. But what happens with PMS is that you give the lady the rating scales and she goes home and fills them in over a month or two and marks out when her period is. And you're looking for that change pre and post period. Now that, that, that's, if you're, that's if you're doing research. You can also do it though. Um, it's useful to do it clinically when you're seeing patients, but often it's, it's so obvious that, that the diagnosis is. Um, uh, but but if, you're, if you're going to enroll people into clinical studies, you have to have demonstrated uh, quite a significant change uh, of symptoms before and after the period, so and they have to be defined in certain ways that I won't go into now. Uh, so this is so the, the most widely used diagnostic criteria are the, the the diagnostic and statistical manual. So they're published by the American Psychiatric Association, and uh, they're, they're kind of their rivals criteria to the ICD, the International Classification of Diseases, which which the the WHO, the World Health Organization, I shouldn't say rival. I mean, they're, thankfully, they're very, very similar now. 30 years ago, they were quite different. But uh, reassuringly, they, they look very similar now. And um, so in, in DSM-5, which came out a number of years ago, premenstrual dysphoric disorder was recognized finally as a, as a, a condition in its own right. And it's, it's defined as having five of the following uh, present for one week premenstruation and improving within a few days of the period. So as I said, those, those um, four uh, core uh, emotional features, you have to have one of these, irritability or anger, depression, hopelessness, or negative thoughts and feelings about oneself, critical, self-critical thoughts, mood lability, which is this rapid fluctuation in mood, and anxiety and tension. And then there are lots of other ones. There's decreased interest is one, concentration difficulties, uh, a marked lack of energy, food cravings. And now the food cravings are, are the food cravings are a bit like those of somebody who's stressed or depressed. Nobody who's stressed or depressed craves salad or tomatoes, you know, <laughs> you know because they, they don't do anything. To, I shouldn't give a, you know, they're, they're, they're great for you long term, I'm sure, but they don't, they don't 
they don't do what the depressed or stressed person wants. What a depressed or stressed person eats for is to get a, is to get a hit off it, to get a kind of serotonin, a, to get a bit of a boost in their mood. Now, now, separate to that, there's the whole women and chocolate thing, and I can't, I don't understand that. <laughs> That's, scientists haven't quite figured that one out yet, but, uh, but women do seem to have this differential preference for chocolate compared to men. But what both genders crave is things like starchy food, so biscuits, crisps, chips, and then sweet things as well. And uh, so, but what can also happen in, in PMDD is interestingly salty, starchy things. So people will like, uh, in America, they'll go for uh, Fritos and Doritos, which you can get here now, these kind of really salty, uh, starchy things. Then you get hy hypersomnia or insomnia, sleeping too much, sleeping too little, and feeling overwhelmed or out of control. And um, then you can get physical symptoms, and I described them. So you get this fluid retention, rings don't fit, clothes feel very tight, the person can feel like they're kind of um, bloated and uh, you can get uh, headaches, uh, aches and pains, you can get all kinds of physical symptoms with it. Uh, and then, then so just some sub stuff about it, you know, they, they have to, the symptoms have to interfere. And this is the same with any diagnosis of any illness, be it panic disorder, schizophrenia, alcohol abuse, this, the difficulties must interfere with some part of your functioning, be it work or school or relationships. And uh, it can't be due to another disorder. I'll speak about what those ones are in, shortly. And then it's confirmed, as I said, prospectively over, over a number of cycles. That's how it's officially diagnosed. So, so what causes it? Well, going back again, remember I said that the, the, the thinking is that it's, it's not that the levels of hormones are abnormal. So you'll be familiar with things like thyroid disease, hyperthyroidism. And, and in that, the thyroid gets overactive and pumps out loads of thyroid hormone and people feel very unwell and so on. That, that isn't the case with this. The, hormone, the, the ovaries in most women are working normally, but it's the response within the body and the brain that's, that's, that's kicking in these problems. So how do we know, what makes us think that the hormones are involved? Well, one would be that um, we know that ovariectomy, in other words, removal of the functioning of the ovaries. If the ovaries stop working, the condition gets better. So that can happen with menopause, where the ovaries stop working. It can happen if they're removed surgically, or it can happen if, if, you, if you do it chemically with medication. There's a medicine called Lupron, which is given, and uh, it's used in medicine to treat endometriosis, and um, it's used in males to treat um, uh, things like prostate cancer. And what it does is it shuts down uh, the testicular functioning in men and the ovaries in women, so it, it just stops them releasing hormones. And, and that is uh, largely curative of PMDD for women. And you could argue, well, then you're going to say, well, I presume that's the treatment then, Dr. Daly. And, but, but unfortunately, it's pretty much not because the, the, sometimes the, the, the cure is worse than the condition. The, 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 there can be a lot of unwanted mood changes when you do that because what you're doing is you're plunging the woman into a premature menopausal state. And also you get uh, osteoporosis and there can be effects on the heart and other things. So it, it, it is a, it is a, it's, it's, it's not widely used. I have never uh, overseen, I don't, it wouldn't be a psychiatrist doing, it might be a, a gynecologist or an endocrinologist particularly, but it, it, it's not, it's, 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 uh, it's more that it's anecdotally used. There's, there, there, there have, you know, it is in some centers, I've heard it being used in the UK for instance, but uh, it's, it's not widely used at all. Um, and so another thing then is the uh, menstrual cycle exposure theory. I'll come back to that in a minute. Just this Lupron study, this is interesting. So if you remember what I was saying, this was, this was one of the first really big uh, PMDD studies that was published uh, on, on, on the role of hormones. And it was unusual in it for many reasons. One was, so this is the group I worked with, uh, Peter Schmidt. He went to the College of Surgeons. He was a Canadian chap. And, uh, he was my boss when I worked there. So this was the New England Journal of Medicine, which is published out of the Mass Gen Massachusetts General Hospital. So it's a medical journal. It's the, one of the big, it's like the British Medical Journal. Well, they, they'd say we're 10 times bigger. It's, 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 our, it's arguably the biggest medical journal in the world. Now, unfortunately, they published it a year before I got there, so I didn't have my name on it, but anyway, such is life. But uh, it was a great study. What they did was, it was very elegant, and it, and it relied on some fantastic women normal volunteers and women with PMDD to volunteer for the study. They didn't, they didn't get paid for this. This was, this was amazing that women would, would, when you hear what they did, that they would put themselves through this to, 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 to help other women. So what was done was 
there was a group of women with the PMS or PMDD and a group without, and both groups were given this Lupron. Uh, it's given as an injection, and what happened then was that the, the ovaries shut down, and so, so the levels of female hormones just went right, very, very low. And what happened then was, in women without PMS, they, they didn't feel any different. They were filling in rating scales as they went through this. But the women, so the, the, they were the normal volunteers without PMS, but the women with PMS, PMDD, felt much, much better. Because their symptoms went away, the theory being that they, they weren't subject to the fluctuating levels of the hormone anymore. And this went on for about six weeks. And then what happened was that the hormones got added back, but it was done blindly to both the women. So the women were taking, putting patches on and, t and, in, and using pessaries. And, and while this was going on at first, they were inactive placebos, but at a certain stage without the women knowing or the researchers doing the rating scales, they switched it back to estrogen and progesterone. The normal volunteers, what happened? Nothing. They didn't, they didn't feel any different. The women with PMS, within 12 hours, some women within minutes of putting them in, the PMS was right back again with, the, with, this, with this change. So it was very suggestive of the role of how the, of how the female hormones are, are really contributing significantly to the condition and the changes in them. So, th so this, is, this is a theory now, which is an interesting one. And again, I, it, this, is a, this is a theory. It's not, it's, it's not, it's, 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 cons it's an ev a sort of an evolutionary theory of the condition. I think it's attractive. I don't, I don't think it, it has all the answers, unfortunately. Uh, well, maybe fortunately, but it's, it's just an interesting thing to reflect on. So, you know the way we hear a lot now about diseases of modern life, so things like heart disease uh, or diseases because of the way we live that we don't move around enough or we eat the wrong things or then in mental health we have this classic thing of stress related conditions which are related to the idea that our bodies haven't caught up with modern living. That, that, uh, 5,000 years ago, we were, it was good to, to if, if, if the guy in the next tribe in the valley across the way came with his mates with spears and, and, and so you saw them coming, so your adrenaline levels would go up and you'd grab your family and get out of Dodge quickly. And, and so that was, that was good then. But the problem is, if you're having a disagreement with your boss, that, that response is not a good one and, and, and your adrenaline goes up, your heart rate goes up and, and your muscles flex and your brain goes into overdrive. So, so there's this argument that a lot of these stress-related conditions like generalized anxiety and even panic are our are, are bodies not catching up with the modern world or the, the world has changed so quickly. So this is a theory of, of, for PMDD. Again, it's just a theory and it, and it doesn't fully explain it, but it, it puts forward that PMDD is related to modern living, to the way people live now, women live. So the theory being that the biological basis to it is, is, is that it's the, it's the exposure to multiple menstrual cycles that makes women more vulnerable to getting the condition. And what would have happened, say, 150 years ago, if you think of it, was that the average woman wouldn't have entered puberty till about 17. And women started having their children at about 19 or 20, say 150 or 200 years ago. And a woman would spend most of the next 10 years either pregnant or breastfeeding. And so by the time, say, a woman was 25, she might have had maybe a couple of dozen periods, the average woman. Whereas now, the theory is that, that women, for reasons we don't understand, probably nutritional, that they enter puberty much earlier. And uh, certainly in the West, women uh, would delay having children till later. So the average woman in her mid-20s now might have had 100, 150 um, periods in her life and that, and that the brain hasn't caught up with that. So, and, and what would support that? What would, well, well, one would be that you don't tend to see PMDD until people are a bit older. So you wouldn't really see it in teens or even early 20s. It's usually a condition of late 20s, 30s and 40s. And it's known from studies of women with the condition that it's commoner. The earlier you enter puberty, the bigger the risk is of getting it. Women who have had no children are unfortunately at, at considerably more risk of developing it than women who have had children. And the more children you've had, the greater protection, because what happens during, the theory is that during pregnancy, your, your levels of hormones are steady. They're not, they're not going up and down, up and down. Breastfeeding is protective against it. Uh, uh, again, you would have had to have a lot of kids and done a lot of breastfeeding to get a protective benefit from it, but there were, there were, because breastfeeding delays the return of periods, and, and the condition is commoner as women age. And, and we know that it worsens the closer women get to menopause. So a study I was involved in in 06 showed that 20% uh, of women who, who appeared to have depression in the menopause actually had 
PMS or PMDD that was worsening as they got older. So again, this is just a theory. It's an interesting thing to, to note, but, it, but it, it, it doesn't have all the answers or anything like that. Okay, so I've talked a bit about what does it look like and, 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 and how does it affect people. And then uh, the differential diagnosis, that means what, what could it be something else? Or what are the other conditions that your doctor should be considering when he or she sees you with this? Well, there's some mental health ones, so they would include uh, depression, obviously, cyclothymia. So that's like a variant of a bipolar illness where you, where you have more minor mood swings that aren't as dramatic. And, uh, and you, can, you can see that. Uh, that's quite easy to mistake for this. Generalized anxiety where people, so this is looking more less at the depressive symptoms and more at the anxious, uneasy, irritable symptoms, and that can, that can mimic it a bit. And panic and even bipolar disorder. But, but, the, but the big thing is that, again, it's that thing of the symptoms being very marked a week to 10 days before the period and then the period kicking in. And uh, it varies with that, but most women will feel better within about a maximum of 36 to 48 hours. And some, some women within minutes of the period beginning feel, feel this lift in it. Uh, and and um, so, uh, so that's the uh, that's sort of background. Now, what, remember I was saying earlier though, what, what can happen a lot is that you could, you could have a mental health condition and then it worsens before your period. So, so uh, this is the biggest study ever done of, of, of antidepressant treatment of depression. And it found that 64% um, of women in it had a premenstrual worsening of that of their depression, which I think is very interesting. And it's really under, it's neglected this whole area of, of, of premenstrual worsening of, of any mental health condition. And um, by far the likeliest time for a woman to be admitted to a mental hospital is the week before her period begins. There have been studies that have been shown. So, so it's, uh, there's probably a complex interaction there. And unfortunately, it's just, it's, it's, quite, it's quite understudied. And depressingly, this whole field is, is not, uh, there's, there's a Swedish group that are becoming very active, which is good. There are some doctors in the UK. But I mean, when you think of a condition that affects so many women at, at I mean, any time in a woman's life is important, but these, tri these ages, the, the, you know, the peak of your life and you're, and you're getting this condition, it's, 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 um, it's quite disappointing, the, lack of, the relative lack of funding and study of it. And in the US, with the, with the, the, the Trump uh, administration has slashed uh, uh, medical research funding. And uh, so um, the department I worked in is, is down to a skeleton staff now and is doing almost no research, um, disappointingly. So back to this. So this is a very important thing for any of you who may have this, or it, and it doesn't get enough sort of um, focus. But the, the commonest medical thing that can mimic this is hypothyroidism. So um, that's a very high amount. So nearly one in five women who, who, sorry, I didn't really display that chart, that thing right. What I'm getting at there is of women with PMDD. In some studies, nearly one in five had undiagnosed sluggish thyroid or hypothyroidism treated just by a thyroid tablet, that's all, and it made the PMDD go away. So, so you should never, nobody should be diagnosed with it without having their thyroid levels checked and probably repeatedly checked. And if I was a woman with this condition, there's a range of your thyroid, and it varies according to the lab that's doing it, but in Beaumont, where I work, it'd be seven to 14. Uh, it should be your free thyroxine. So, so if I was a woman with PMDD and I was at seven or eight, I'd be going to my doctor and saying, can you put, would you consider putting me on some thyroid hormone to get me up a little higher, but within the normal range? You know, you don't, because you, if you go above the range, you can get heart arrhythmias, and again, you get thinning of the bones. But, um, but you, can, you can take a very small amount, like two or three times a week of a half of a smallest tablet. So I've, I've done that with a number of patients where there's been, that would be called low normal levels of thyroid hormone, and it can help. Um, so anemia can, can, can mimic this or exacerbate it. There's these autoimmune conditions like lupus and these things, which are thankfully relatively rare, diabetes. Endometriosis is this painful um, overgrowth of tissue in the, in the um, uterus. And then polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is a, which is a, a complicated uh, condition um, where, where, where cysts in the ovaries release hormones, which cause a lot of... Now, that's difficult, different to PMDD because in that condition, you're getting large, big changes in hormonal levels caused by these cysts. And, um, 
and releasing often a lot of testosterone and stuff like that. But, but the message from this would be, it may be another condition or it may be a worsening of, 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 of another condition, but you know, um, I'm speaking to you like your group of doctors, but that's fine. Don't forget the thyroid, right? <laughs> okay, so, um, so as I said, I said this earlier, that 20% of depressed perimenopausal women actually have PMDD that's worsening. That was a, a paper that I um, helped write, a study that I did. And, um, and unfortunately, these things do tend to cluster a bit, not fully, so don't, if you suffer from one, it doesn't necessarily mean you're definitely gonna get the other, but your risk is up a bit if you have postnatal depression of, of getting, uh, getting, say, perimenopausal depression, and PMDD can increase the risk a bit too. What about the pill then? Have you heard about the pill being used and that kind of thing? The pill is an interesting thing. Um, the, the pill was designed by, kind of invented or designed by a doctor, a, a gynecologist called Chris Rock. And he worked at the first hospital I worked in, in America in Boston called the Brigham and Women's. The, it's, the full name is the Brigham and Women's Lying In Hospital. And it's a very big center for, um, for a big specialist maternity hospital. And Chris Rock was a Catholic uh, gynecologist, uh, gynecologist who, who wanted to try and make a contraceptive that would be acceptable to the Catholic Church. And he, he designed the pill. And what he did was he built in, uh, so when you take the pill conventionally, you take it for a number of days, anywhere from say 21 to about 26, and then you have a number of days built in of the placebo and you get a smaller, a lighter period. He did that in the hope that it would mimic uh, a woman's natural cycle and that the church would accept it. But Humanae Vitae, which was published uh, 50 years ago last year by Pope Paul VI, uh, rejected it and did not accept it, which was, um, so, so the pill came out in 1960, Humanae Vitae, 1968, and it was a, you know, it was, um, uh, Ireland was a different place at the time, it was very influential, great disappointment to women and men at the time who, who were looking for, you know, I mean, uh, you had the situation where you needed a prescription to get the pill, you needed, you needed a prescription anyway, but you needed a marriage license, this kind of stuff, anyway, I won't get into all of that, but the, the pill is a bit of a mixed bag as regards, uh, as regards uh, PMDD, and, and, and I won't offer a prize for, for anyone who tells me why. Of course, part of the reason is you're getting these ups and downs of the hormones again. That's the problem, is that you're, 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 you're taking these hormones and then you, you come off them for a few days to build in the, the, this period. That, and, and the only reason, Chris, I, I presumed in med school that the reason that, that the pill was made like that was so that there would be, um, so that it wouldn't allow excessive growth of the lining of the womb. Uh, because if you think about it, if it's, if it's growing slowly and you don't have a chance to have a period, well, it, what would happen, you know? And, uh, but it wasn't that at all, because what happens is the rate of regrowth isn't that strong, and once there's a certain level, it just sort of <laughs> settles down. So, so, the, so the most popular pill in America now is a pill called Seasonale, and, it, and, it, and, and the woman who takes this only has a period four times a year with it. So it's become really popular, and, uh, and there's no rate of... of, of problems with, with the uterus or anything like that. And there are a lot of studies underway at the moment to see d does that help with PMDD. So, so they haven't been published yet, but the hope is that, that, that it might be a benefit because again, you're, it's, 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 not, it's not the high or low levels in PMDD of female hormones, it's the up and down, this thing that I showed at the beginning. So, so but well, what, what are considerations about the pill? Um, we know that uh, lower doses of, of, of estradiol, which is, you know, they're, they're basically composed of estrogen and progesterone. The lower doses of estrogen are, are, are better if, if someone has PMDD. Um, and so some GPs are happy to try and mimic seasonale and will give women more extended cycles. Uh, you'd need to speak to your GP about that though. Uh, but some of them will and will and will get women to, to leave out that four day placebo tablet when the period occurs and to just go for a more continual thing. Don't go and do this on your own though. You, you know, you need to liaise with your GP about this kind of thing. And it's, and it's, and the, it's not fully in that, the, that the, it, it's unlikely to cure PMDD, but in some women it may help. This thing called, the, the progesterone part of the pill can be various different forms, but this is one. Um, drospirinone is sorry now again this is for a medical audience but this is this is this is a type of progesterone and this helps with fluid retention it actually acts as a diuretic so it can help a bit but anyway um, 
Uh, again, very medically, don't worry about this, but here's something you can remember, right? The, this pill called Yaz, okay? Is there anyone old enough? Was she a singer in the 80s or something? Yeah, she was, yeah, yeah, she, she was, I can't remember the songs. Oh yeah, the only way is up, it's not it, yeah. So anyway, so, uh, <laughs> sorry, I, dig I digress. Uh, so anyway, this, 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 this preparation of pill called Yaz in the United States, right? It ha and this is available in Ireland, okay? In the US, it has the approval for the treatment of PMDD in women desiring the oral contraceptive pill. So it, it's, a bit of a, it's a bit of a saying two things at once, but it's saying if a woman has PMDD and wants to go on the pill, this is the pill to go on, and it may be of a bit of benefit. It's not considered a first-line treatment or anything like that, but it's worthwhile remembering that I sound like a spokesman for this company. I don't know who makes it or anything. But, but what the features of it that help are that it's got low levels of estradiol. And again, estradiol is the estrogen that gets into your brain. And then the drospirinone, it's got this, so it's got this, um, it's got this anti -med anyway, medical gobbledygook. But what it means is that it, it, it helps with fluid retention. And they, some people think that could be aligned to irritability in that. But it can decrease some of the symptoms. It's not curative or anything. But it's either, if somebody wants to try the pill for uh, PMDD, this would be the one that you would, you would go for first. And if, you're going to, if you want to use the pill as your contracep method of contraception and you're prone to PMDD, this would be the one to... To, to, to ask your GP for. Now, to get into, we're okay for time, yes, yeah. so to get into some sort of uh, treatment and what can you do about it then? So um, thankfully there's quite a lot which doesn't involve tablets and medicines and that kind of, well, medicines, uh, I'll get, I will get to those though. So a lot of it is recognizing the condition and see, <laughs> seeing that you have it and understanding it. And so what I, I used to find with the, with the women that I used to see at my clinic, uh, that they would start using a diary and very, it's amazing how we forget things and we, um, and, and it can often, it would be very obvious once a woman keeps a diary, but it's amazing how we tend to forget nasty things. They say that's how the human race survives because childbirth is so unpleasant. But, so if women really remembered how awful it was, we'd all die out, but that it just, you know, thankfully we all forget nasty things. But women with PMS and PMDD find that once you start keeping a diary, it, it's, it's, it sounds so obvious, but you can start planning. You can say, well, maybe I shouldn't go on holidays that week. That's the week before my period. Let's go the week after, that kind of thing. It also gives a sense of empowerment. And what you're getting into here is, is the whole cognitive behavioral thing of, of feeling more in control, anticipating stuff, um, recognizing things when they come. So if, if, if someone is developing the condition and they find they're explosive, and then they go, oh, it's, yeah, when is my period? You ask that again. This is what's happening to me. It's not that I'm, you know, it's not that Mary is being a bitch to me or whatever. It's that I'm, 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 I'm getting, un I'm feeling unwell again. So keeping a diary and discussing, planning, speaking with your loved ones, that kind of thing. Complex carbohydrates then, they're quite interesting. The, um, so you know this thing, serotonin. So serotonin is this chemical messenger in the brain. So the brain, S nerves in the brain don't, they communicate through these chemical messengers. Serotonin is involved and in, implicated in lots of mental health difficulties, anxiety and depression and so on. And what happens is um, if you, there, it, 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 there's a certain, serotonin is made from a, from a particular um, building block called tryptophan. It's a type of amino acid. And uh, that, only, that will only get into your, be absorbed into your body when you, when you have reasonable amounts of carbohydrate flushing around, you know. So, um, uh, so uh, it, that's one of the reasons people crave carbohydrates when they're feeling down. But there's a lot of interest in complex carbohydrates to see can it help PMDD. And the general consensus is it can. So switching to things like brown rice and brown pasta and brown bread. That, that we don't fully understand the mechanism. It may be related to this tryptophan going on to boost your serotonin levels. Uh, one anecdote, and I never saw a study on it, but a lot of women who had it badly found and reported to me that uh, uh, corn, and corn has lots of L-tryptophan in it. So, uh, you know, if you, you know, corn on the cob or corn, corn flakes or, uh, or those corn, you can get, I think you get crackers now, like the rice cakes, they make them out of corn. But if, if I had PMDD, I would be trying that. I would be eating to see, can that, um, loading up on that, not loading, you know, you don't want to end up <laughs> getting too big from it all, but, but, but using those things, switching my carbs and sort of pushing them a bit in the 10 days before the period is due. Decreasing alcohol and caffeine, you could argue that with any big mental health condition, but 
caffeine particularly can make people very jittery. Um, uh, you know, the, the new DSM has caffeineism, which is intoxication with caffeine. People can get very sick if you if you drank, sat down and drank five espressos and you weren't used to it. You could you could feel extremely sick and panicky and get a serious heart change and that kind of thing. Increasing exercise can help. Uh, it's aerobic, you have to get the heart rate up. These, the studies seem to show that, the limited studies that have been done. So um, anything that gets you breathing quicker, brisk walking, uh, cycling, spinning if you can, any of this kind of stuff, you know, I mean, spinning might be not for everybody, but you know, these things that get you rather than say lifting weights or doing yoga, they, they can help generally with stress, but they don't, they won't, they won't help PMDD particularly. But the, the, the minor tranquilizers, benzodiazepines were favored uh, back in the early 70s, but while they do treat anxiety, they're obviously very addictive. So, but, but you will have people will use them and benefit for, say, the week, or the, the people can get a peak, say, three days before the period and be really bad. And, and say, if, if, your symptom, if your symptoms involve a lot of anxiety, it's fine to take a minor tranquilizer at that time briefly. I wouldn't, you know, if you take them all the time, they lose their benefits. They be, they, you know, your body gets used to them, but you can, you can take them if the, if the anxiety is bad. Um, what about talking therapy? Therapies because I'm, you know, the talk is so biological, but so the talking therapies, th there's been a lot more focus on these recently, and, and, it's, and it's, it's good actually, it's, it's, it's quite encouraging. So the sort of theory behind, um, um, the, the theory behind CBT uh, for, for any condition is, is a sort of a three-way model, so that there's, it's felt that there's, that there's um, a complex interaction um, with, with, I'll stand back now in a second. Um, with the, with the, with the way we, the way we think, our thinking patterns, the way we act or behave, what we do, and the way we feel, and that these these three things are linked. And so, uh, CBT was kind of invented by a guy called Aaron Beck, who was a psychiatrist in New York, uh, and he uh, he devised a type of talking therapy, which which became a huge hit very quickly because for a number of reasons it was. It was uh, standardized, so you could, you could teach it to people. It, it had a language that was understandable. It was built on theory and logic, uh, and people would argue, well, you know, previous types of psychotherapy, like psychoanalytic was talking about your childhood and your love of your mother and your hatred of your dad, or and your, uh, all these complicated things that Jung and Freud came up with. And, and cognitive behavioral therapy was much more kind of logical, uh, lots of research were done into it and, and it was shown to be very effective for many conditions, primarily depression, but now for many others. And it's, there's this inter, interlink. So, so for instance, a classic thing for someone with depression might be that um, uh, I, 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 I think uh, when I'm down, I, I, I think that I'm useless and that people don't like me. That makes me feel worse and that makes me hide away from people. I act differently, I withdraw myself, but then the therapist will say, well, you know what you need to do then, he will help, he or she will address and find these automatic negative thoughts, try and get you to gently challenge them and simultaneously push yourself out there, uh, fighting against the urges and then, and then you see the mood lifting. So, I'm, you know, I'm shrinking a three hour session into 10 seconds there, but that's an example of kind of how it might work for in one model. But CBT is getting, has had a lot more focus on it in the last 10 years and it's been generally good and two years ago the UK College of Gynecologists came out with a, a position paper and they, and they pushed it, they, they endorsed it and said look this really should be a mainstay of treatment for this condition and I, I probably wouldn't have thought that maybe 15 years ago but, but looking through the, the research, I won't go into it now, but, it, but it, it, it is encouraging. Again there's like many things in life, it'd be Occasionally there are things, the, the hypothyroidism, you take the thyroid tablet, it's gone, you're better, it's done usually. But there's very few conditions in life that are like that and, and, and mental health things, are, you know, they are, are rare as it's like that. So CBT won't cure it, but again, if, 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 you, have a, if you have the condition, you can go at it all guns blazing. So you can, you know, you can, you can do your, your diary working your anticipation, uh, changing your diet, monitoring your alcohol and so on, <laughs> increasing exercise. And then you get into other levels of treatment. 
Now, so um, th this Agnes Canthus is, is very widely used for treating. You get it in Holland and Barrett and places. We'll, we'll, you can get it there. It's, it's from a plant called the chaseberry. And, um, you know, these, these, um, these herbal treatments have, a, a lot of our medicines historically, you know, aspirin came from, a lot of them came from, say, the Amazon. They were just from various places. They came from, uh, you know, quinine from, for, for treating malaria, et cetera, et cetera. The, the German, the most commonly prescribed antidepressant in Germany is um, St. John's wort, and, and it does have antidepressant effects in it. So anyway, uh, the ch Chaseberry is, the, the, the studies, the, the, the pure researchers question it because they say, look, these studies are not robustly designed, and did the women have true PMDD, and did they, and you know, were they blinded when they were taking this? Did they could because there is they, they might have felt a bitter taste off the Agnes Canthus tablet, etc. And look, okay, but that's for the people writing the papers. I mean, if you know, if you have the condition, this is a safe thing to take. So it's definitely something to try because you could say, well, you know, okay, there was a fifty percent or thirty or forty percent placebo response, but. Look, I, you know, I, I may I may be in a woman who responds to it, and it's safe. So it's certainly one to try. Primrose oil has less evidence behind it, but certainly the Agnes Canthus would have uh, the Chaseberry would have. It's it's generally considered beneficial, but but not dr dramatically so. Vitamin B6. So this is there's two things here that are not these. None of these are medic medicines or anything. But vitamin B6 is an interesting one. So that's um, pyridoxine. So you can get that from. You can get that from, uh, uh, you could probably get it from, from somewhere like, no, you, I'm not sure how long about it. Your, your pharmacist might have it. Your GP can certainly write a prescription for it. Uh, you need to take it at quite a high dose, which is 50 to 100 milligrams a day, but you don't go over that. Uh, and the danger sometimes is that people can go on this and take a multivitamin that already has it. The reason you don't go over 100 milligrams is that you can get this painful inflammation in your nerves, a peripheral neuropathy. So, um, but 50 to 100 milligrams is very safe. And 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 uh, so this would be this would be a, a classic sort of first step that I would prescribe for people if I'm doing reaching for my prescription pad would be uh, starting off vitamin B6 and then with the instruction to make sure any multivitamin you take or any supplement does not have more B6 in it. So pyridoxine or vitamin B6. This was a this is a meta analysis where 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 a researcher will gather all the research done and, 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 and put it through the mill and, and, and analyze the data. And it came out with a weak support. But, you know, for something that's simply a vitamin, you know, when you start, if you get, if you had a bit of weak, weak benefit from that and some from the chaseberry, suddenly you're accumulating more benefits. Now, calcium would have a more robust uh, response rate, nearly 50% versus placebo in the biggest study that was ever done by Jacobs. And, and uh, so calcium is, um, it did tend to work for all symptoms, but it was particularly good for irritability. It wasn't, now it did, sorry, it didn't work for them all, except fatigue and insomnia, it didn't do much for. So you can take calcium in a couple of ways. One is a calcitude with D3. So that's a prescription thing. That's one of these kind of Rennie type chalky things, you know, you take it. You need to take it with the D3, the vitamin D3, because um, again, getting into medical fine print, but it increases your risk of hardening of the arteries because it'll, it'll end up lining the arteries of your, of your heart and so on if you take it without the D3. Also, the D3 gets it into your bones too. So the calcitude now has vitamin, has, uh, vitamin D3 in it. Um, uh, sorry, has, yeah, vitamin D3. You can get a calcium tablet in Holland and Barrett, but because, of, because it doesn't have the vitamin D3, I, I tend to tell women, if you're gonna take the tablet, uh, just just take it for the week before your period. So 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 for these other things, you could take these throughout your cycle, and then this one. See, this isn't the easiest to take. Calcium constipates people. So, I most women I know tend to take this for the week to ten days before their period. This one, yeah, and um, and then you can move on. So you've got all your stuff that you've tried, and then you can go on to antidepressant treatments, uh, SSRIs, and um, the background of this is that um, back to the serotonin again. So, so if, if if just people in general have decreased levels of serotonin in their bodies, they, it makes them feel impulsive, dysphoric, which is irritable, and uh, they crave carbohydrates, just like people who are suffering P, women who are suffering PMDD. And similarly, if you if you have women with PMDD and you lower, you give them a tryptophan. Remember, that's the building block for serotonin. Uh, if you give them a diet low in that or you block 
serotonin with this thing called metergoline. So if you just lower serotonin levels in women with PMDD, it's like putting petrol on a fire. It greatly flares up the PMDD. So this is all suggesting that this chemical messenger serotonin has a big role in, it may have a big role in the condition. And we know as well that some antidepressants work less through serotonin and more through a chemical messenger called noradrenaline. So Effexor would be one of those and uh, Cymbalta would be another one. These are not as useful, but having said that, venlafaxine can help women, particularly if they're anxious, but generally they would not be first-line antidepressant treatments. It would be more these guys, your Prozac, Citalopram, Cipramil, Lexapro, Sertraline, Lustral, Lucert, those kind of ones. Now, how good are they? Well, see, back when there was a lot more of this research going on, I mean, there, have, there, is, there was a lot of research done back in the 90s the 90s was the decade of the brain for the World Health Organization and psychiatry research got huge amounts of funding and neurology research. So, so there were, there were um, Mayor Steiner in New York was able to look at 30 published studies of SSRIs for PMDD and it was really amazing. 29 out of the 30 showed that they were beneficial. So that was very impressive. And the thing is, you know the way if any of you have experienced depression, your doctor will have told you, you know, to start these and wait. You won't feel anything for many weeks. You need to take two or three weeks or more. It's, that's not the case with PMDD. They tend to work very quickly and we don't understand that. We think they work a different way. And it, they may work through these things called neurosteroids. I've nearly done the talk. I'll, I'll just mention what they are in a minute. So. Um, but um, what happens then is that, to be careful of, w women with PMDD are very sensitive to the side effects of medications. We, we don't understand why. Uh, probably the condition has done something, but y women tend not to tolerate high doses of these medicines, so, um, and you tend often not to need them. But so for PMDD, you might go on 50 of sertraline, uh, say five or 10 of Lexapro. T you might start at 10 of Cipramil, that kind of thing. And, and the women then, as I said, are more likely to get side effects. And uh, so my, my whole med school was one massive mnemonic and acronym of remembering things, but uh, I should have patented them, but I never thought of it. But uh, so this is the one I did for the side effects of SSRIs, HID, SAND, headaches, insomnia, dizziness. You'll say, Jesus, I'll never take these after hearing this. Headaches, insomnia, dizziness, sexual dysfunction, anorexia, which is loss of appetite, nausea and diarrhea. Now, Okay, that's a big list, but you, if you've got the list of Panadol, you'd start being scared of taking one. These are commoner when you take higher doses. At these doses, these, these difficulties are much less common. And uh, this is an important thing I'm going to show to you now. This is this pulsed administration. So do you remember I was saying that you don't have to, that they work very quickly, okay? So say if you're going on SSRIs and... Um, so you know that you're going to be more vulnerable to getting side effects. And, and a lot of people will say, look, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, why do I have to take these, these kind of tablets? And so, so one way that can be helpful is that you just take them when you need them. So that means that if you remember the symptoms are there before the period comes. So, so pulsed administration means like this. So, so say, say uh, you have a 28 day menstrual cycle. Okay. So there's day 14 there. I know I'm going to draw this wrong anyway, but here I'll do my best. So, so here we go. So this is so what happens then is that um, you, you count. The, 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 this is day one of your of your cycle. That means the day that your period starts. Okay. So, so you count that as day one. And what you do is so you've got you, you've got your say whatever cipramil uh, ten milligrams. Okay. So uh, day one, and you count two weeks forward until day fourteen, around the time of ovulation. And then, you, and then you start your medicine then. You start that. And you start it on day 14, two weeks after your period starts, and you keep going until your period ends. And that could be day 28, it could be day 25, it could be day 31, you know. But you keep taking until your period stops, and then you start all over again. You, you, you come off the meds, uh, you take no more medicines, because uh, you don't need them, and you, and you count two weeks ahead and start them again. Um, the, 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 the doctors immediately jump up and down when I say this, and they say, but you, how could you do that? They say, what about the withdrawal? Because these things, you know, they, they all carry a warning that 
if you, if you come off them too quickly that you can get a withdrawal, but you're not on them long enough to get it. Do you follow me? You need to be on them for weeks and weeks continuously to get this discontinuation where you feel dreadful and awful. But if you take them this way, you can kind of have your cake and eat it. So your, so your blood levels go right down and then, and then they go up and reach a peak for when you need it most and then, and then they come down. And, you, and it's not like depression where you have to wait two weeks for them to work because they can work very quickly. And so I've had, I've had situations where I've had women with depression with super Pose PMDD, so they might they might be on uh, they might be on um, 50 milligrams of say sertraline here, and then once once this comes, they can double up to 100 to get the extra oomph before their period. Uh, yeah, so uh, so this, you know you can you can t you can tailor these things with your doctor. The problem is this stuff is it's not it's quite specialized. It's it isn't it isn't, but. You know, when I give this talk to psychiatrists, they're just blinking, looking at me. They don't, they, 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 you know, this is not, this is not on the curriculum for uh, psychiatry training, any of this stuff, unfortunately. There's no, there, there, there needs to be modules uh, on it. Uh, people are taught about, a lot about uh, postnatal depression, as they should be, but this, this condition doesn't get the, the, the attention it should. Okay, we're nearly done now. So. What about the future? Are there any, this is my last slide, I think. So are there any emerging therapies or things for the future? Dietary supplements, there are these uh, uh, very tryptophan-rich drinks that are being uh, piloted and tested in America. They're a combination of complex carbohydrates and, and, and uh, kind of very high tryptophan, probably made from corn-based stuff to try and uh, see is that beneficial. There are these studies, as I said, of seasonality, looking at the low-dose continual oral contraceptive pill. And then this final thing is allopregnanolone. What that is, that, that's, a, that's a big, long name for progesterone in the body gets broken down into loads of different subcompounds. One of them is called allopregnanolone. And that Swedish group that I mentioned have, have found that, um, that uh, giving this allopregnanolone uh, which is a breakdown product of progesterone, greatly worsens PMDD. And so they're now doing studies looking at um, uh, medications that, that block this allopregnanolone and, and, and stop uh, excessive or stop its effects uh, before the period. So, so there are quite a few things in the pipeline, um, but uh, so, and things are changing. So, I mean, hopefully, if I was to give this talk in five years, a lot of this stuff would have, would have developed a good bit more. So, uh, I, so just to summarize then again, again, this is more for medical audience, so apologies, it's very medically, but you know, thyroid function, diary, exercise, diet, lifestyle changes, CBT then, consider calcium and or the vitamin B6. I should have it in there as well, sorry, the Agnes Canthus as well, and then a combination of the two, and then if required, the SSRIs can help an awful lot, and that triple combination of B6, calcium, uh, particularly before the period, and your SSRIs can often be very helpful. And that is that. Thanks. <laughs>